I feel that the arts are one of the greatest gifts that the Creator has given us as human beings. And when you're given a gift like this, you have to utilize it, you have to use it. So of course it should be part of our government, because government is about aiding people everywhere and giving them the opportunity for happiness, for fulfillment, for a good life, good health, etc. And the arts are part of that. That was actress, author, and former chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, Jane Alexander. And this is Artworks, the weekly podcast produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm Josephine Reed. As an actress, Jane Alexander is a triple threat. She's equally at home on stage, in film, and on television. And she has the awards to prove it. She won a Tony Award for her first Broadway play, The Great White Hope, and then went on to seven other Tony nominations over the course of her career for roles in plays as varied as Six Rooms, Riverview, The Sisters Rosenzweig, and Honor. She picked up the first of her four Academy Award nominations when she starred in the film version of The Great White Hope. She was also nominated for All the President's Men, Kramer vs. Kramer, and Testament. Her television work includes indelible performances as Eleanor Roosevelt in two different productions. Ironically, she won one of her two Emmy Awards for portraying Eleanor's nemesis, FDR's formidable mother, in the television film Warm Springs. Jane Alexander also has had a career as an influential arts advocate. She was the first artist to become chair of the National Endowment for the Arts. Appointed by Bill Clinton, she arrived in 1993, which was a tumultuous time for the agency. For four years, she led the NEA during this challenging and pivotal period. The agency I came into had about close to 300, if not more, employees and a healthy budget of 175 plus million dollars, despite culture wars that had been ongoing and had actually forced the resignation of John Fronmeyer, my predecessor. So there was a lot of demoralization among the staff, and I think I was brought in because they wanted an artist and somebody who would really stand up for the First Amendment, freedom of expression. and. I was told in no uncertain words not to be wishy-washy about that. Take us back just a few years before that. What was the mandate in 1965 for the National Endowment for the Arts? The mandate, as I remember it, was to reward the best art in our country, hopefully for the benefit of all citizens, of course, with the amount of money then, which was, I believe, seven million in the beginning, something yeah, close something to that. Like that. That was not possible. So they made some very good and strategic grants to American Ballet Theater, I believe was the first. They tended to be the more high-end fine arts. Tell me why you wanted the job as chair of the National Endowment for the Arts. You know, that really wasn't a hard one for me. And the reason was because the NEA had been responsible really for my career as an actress in that a grant was made to Howard Sackler and the arena stage to develop the Great White Hope back in the 60s. I think the grant was given around 66, one of the first ones. And that really made the careers of James Earl Jones and myself. We did it first at arena stage to great acclaim. We went to Broadway with the show where it won the Pulitzer Prize, was made into a movie, and both James Earl and myself were nominated for Academy Awards. This gave James Earl and myself access to all media, if think about it, theater, television, and film. And we made good use of that in our careers, I'll tell you. Your career as an actor and doing your art and then moving into the role of being an arts advocate, did you approach that differently from the way you would approach a role? I don't mean to doubt any kind of sincerity or commitment, but just what skills you used from your training as an actor and brought to that job as chair? It's a very interesting question, Joe. I've never really had that question in my life. 
but it's, it's a very different thing being an administrator and certainly very different being part of a government. Politics is about compromise, finding a common ground. The arts are not about that necessarily. The arts are about searching for truth, searching for truth as the playwright, in this case of Great White Hope or whatever, sees it. And that was a hard lesson for me to learn, to switch a brain that was always searching for some kind of truth of a situation to one seeking compromise with other individuals. Correct me if I'm wrong, though, but certainly as a playwright, yes, it's you know, it's an uncompromising vision. And as an actor as well, but at a certain point in theater and film, it's so collaborative that there has to be a kind of negotiation that happens among everybody. Well, you're right about that. But that is the lessons that I learned very early on as an actress in improvisational theater, which I did quite a bit of with Paul Sills, Second City Workshops. And that was, you accept what is given to you. In other words, if um, you walked into a room and you said, what is wrong with you? I would not deny that there was something wrong. I would take what you gave me and said, oh, well, you know, I have been not feeling well lately. And then we'd go from there. That's the cornerstone of improvisation. So I used my improvisational techniques to begin to understand where other people were coming from and that you can't really change the dynamic of who they are and what they are presenting and you have to work with it. So in that respect, that part of acting worked for me very well. Can you briefly describe your confirmation process as chair? And did did the whole vetting process and all of the courtesy calls, did that give you an inkling of what you were walking into? Yes. Yes. And it was shocking. The other thing that was shocking to me was the amount of material one has to go through in the briefing books. This did not end during my four years because it was so incumbent upon me to be up on whom I I was meeting, uh, what they had done in their lives, what their stance was, what their constituency was, and so on. And these briefing books were huge. I would come home every night with one that would be uh, 120 pages or so. Yeah, the confirmation process gave me a very good inkling uh, about what I was up against. I was very, very fortunate, however. At that time, Ted Kennedy became a really staunch friend and ally, and then I had Republican friends and, and allies, and people forget that that happened during those years of uh, the Clinton administration, but Alan Simpson of Wyoming was one of my greatest supporters, as was Orrin Hatch of Utah, Nancy Kassebaum from K Kansas, remarkable senators, all of them. And if I didn't have them to talk to or be in my court, I would have been a very sad person. Mm -hmm. As you're dealing with Congress and everything that's going on there and in Washington in general and the politics that, that has to go on, you were also traveling throughout the country. Mm -hmm. Why did you decide that that was important? And how did what you see help you lead the agency? I read early on a research paper that the National Endowment for the Arts had done about how many people knew what the NEA was, what it did in the United States of America and the districts. And it was shocking to me that almost 90% of the people who had been interviewed did not know what the NEA was. Those that did know, there was a huge cohort that felt it was a terrible organization because of all the media attention that had been focused on it during the uh, previous administration, Bush Sr and John Fronmeyer's problems with a couple of, of grants that Congress found egregious. So I said, this can't be. We're giving grants to places all around the United States and they don't know what's happening in their district, how we're helping them. And these are matching grants and challenge grants and all kinds of exciting things. So I said to my scheduler, Noel Boxer, I said, I gotta get out there, I've, I wanna see all 50 states this year and 
It was so important, vitally important. Everywhere I went, I had great media attention. So that meant the local and sometimes the state public relations organs, if you will, were focused on the arts, what the NEA was doing, and what they did for the community and for the state. And it was an eye-opener for most people that I met. Of course, the artists knew it. But when the artists and the general public began to come together, that was truly exciting. And they said, oh, now we get it. Oh, that little museum, that children's museum that I go to, you mean that wonderful show about Dr. Seuss was funded by the National Endowment for the Arts, something like that? Oh, that's what you do. So it was no longer in their minds an elitist organization that gave outrageous grants to artists who were doing reprehensible things. So it was well worth it. That, that really made the day. Once I had traveled to all 50 states, which I did in the first 13 months, mm. by that time the first Republican Congress had come in, in 19, the end of 94, and I was ready. I knew what the people wanted out there. I knew that they loved the arts that we were bringing, helping them open theaters and dance halls and community ballet companies, whatever. So once I knew that, I knew that I had been armed with the love of the people, and that was, that was what I fought with for the rest of the couple of years. Because even though the scandals had happened not during your tenure, when Newt Gingrich became Speaker of the House, right. part of what he wanted to do was eliminate the arts endowment. Yeah, it was actually, at one point, top of his hit list, the contract with America. What was his reasoning? Do you remember? Well, I mean, specifically about the arts endowment. Yeah, you know, Gingrich and, and the others thought that the arts and the humanities and public television needed to be privatized. They were not a good use of public money. There was plenty of commercial outlets for the arts. That's what they thought. And what finally happened in that Congress? That Congress, well, it was still there when I left four years later. The contract with America did not succeed. When we finally won the war to keep the National Endowment for the Arts alive, and by the way, the NEH was having its own fights, and PBS was having its own fights, and the Pell Grants were having theirs, yeah. and all the museums, et cetera, when we were all in alliance together. When we finally won, I'll never forget what Pat Williams, who was the congressman from Montana, came up to me and he said, it's bulletproof. Nothing will happen from now on. And I said, how do you know? He said, because you won the big war. It's now part of the system. Now, there were restraints put in, language put in by Congress, which made it much more difficult for an artist. For example, let's say Picasso, he couldn't apply with his erotic art anymore, or if he would, it probably wouldn't get funded, and he would be a fool to try. So that's what happened. So it became much more democratized, if you will, the whole art in that my successors in the role of chairman of the NEA have concentrated more on community art, on funding large challenge projects that all of the United States in one way or another can participate in. And I think that's great because it is definitely under the aegis of what a government agency such as the NEA should be doing. So I'm all for that. I just don't want the individual artists to be left out either, which is what happened at the end of my administration. They cut all the individual fellowships except literature. No writing by committee. No. <laughs> were you always drawn to the arts from the time you were a kid? Yes, I was, yeah. In your book, you tell a really lovely story about how going to a performance with your father when you were young Yes. Was catalyzing. Yes. My dad had uh, come back from the Second World War, and I think uh, when I was about seven, he took me one afternoon to a matinee of a ballet company from Copenhagen, Royal Danish Ballet, I believe, and they were doing Coppelia. I remember this, Joe, as if it was yesterday. It was so stunning. I mean, all through the war, I mean, I was very little, but mom couldn't take us to the movies. We had no theater. We had nothing. We just had a war effort that we'd listen to sporadically on the radio. 
So when dad took me to this, it was like, where has this been all my life? I couldn't believe it. These people leaping in the air and the color and the ladies twirling, pirouetting and pirouetting. Something in me said, oh, that's where I want to be. That's where I want to be. Mom started me with ballet lessons shortly thereafter, but it turned out that my toes were so long that by the time I was 10 and I got on point, they said that I would probably have to break my toes and have them reset. And I just wasn't up for that. So I found another outlet in theater. And then I proceeded to do every school play that I possibly could be in, and community theater, and summer stock, and blah, blah. Do you remember your first professional acting role? My first professional one, where I got paid, (laughs) was probably Rosalind and As You Like It at the Harvard Summer Players, a summer stock company. Wow, that's not a bad first role. It's a wonderful role, and I was all of 22 years old. Perfect time to play her. I was crazy in love, and she was crazy in love. (laughs) (laughs) Now, Jane, when you read The Great White Hope and when you were in rehearsal for it, were you aware that this was a masterpiece? Did you know what you were in? I did. I think we all did. I mean, there were 63 actors playing over 200 roles, and I think most of them, half were African Americans, and more than half, yeah, it was really about their lives. And it was a sweeping, sweeping story about entrenched racism in the boxing business. So, yes, we knew it. We knew very well. It was based on the true story of Jack Johnson, the first heavyweight champion of the world in 1910, who was a larger-than-life character who would walk down the streets of Dallas, Texas, in 1910 and 11 with two tigers on leashes and his white mistress trailing behind. So you can imagine how the South felt about this man and how it was incumbent upon them to get a great white hope to defeat him. So it was a remarkable story and so beautifully acted by this large company that I think we all knew it was going to be incredible. Coming as it did at the height of the black power movement that Stokely Carmichael had been promulgating for a couple of years, Black is Beautiful, it just was perfect timing. As you said, it started at an arena stage and then went to Broadway, and then you and James Earl Jones also starred in the film version. Mm-hmm. Can you talk just a bit about the difference between acting on a stage and acting in a film? Although I had done a few films, this was my first major, major film, 1970-something around there. And so I had, did not have a lot of film experience at all. And I had been playing this role for the long run at Arena Stage and then a year on Broadway. And then James Earl and myself were contracted for over four months in different locations that went from L.A., Arizona, England, Spain. Most of it shot in Spain. The stage I was very comfortable and always have been very comfortable on. And it's my first love. When I got to film, It was shot out of sequence, as most movies are. I didn't quite understand that. Even though I knew exactly what these scenes were all about, the language had been changed a little bit. Howard had, Sackler had had to write it a little bit different for film. And I absolutely froze at one of my major scenes. And Martin Ritt was a great filmmaker. I said, I don't think I can do this scene today. And he said, what? I said, I can't seem to do anything today. And to his credit, he called it off for the whole day, losing $10,000 for the production. In retrospect now, because I've got a, you know maybe 75 films under my belt now, years later, I cannot believe this decision of his, except he was known as an actor's director, and he took me at face value, and I said, I didn't think I could do it. I don't know what happened. I, I did freeze. The next day I came in and I knocked it out of the ballpark. It was fine. But I never, ever did that to a director again. Years later, I thanked Marty, but I said, boy, were you brave to do that. Poor producers. 
And what about on stage? Have you did you ever just go off your lines? Oh yes, you often go off your lines. I mean, I don't know an actor who hasn't. And you just pick and them then up you when just, you can. You just wing it. <laughs> you also most very famously played Eleanor Roosevelt. Just very briefly, the preparation for creating someone who's so present in our minds. It is huge. It's huge. When Joe Lash and Franklin Roosevelt, son of Eleanor and and FDR, approved me. I just burst into tears right in front of them. I didn't know why, except I knew that this was one of the greatest women I was ever going to be given the opportunity to play. And, And then began two years of research, because it was a miniseries for ABC, and ABC executives kept dropping it and saying, I don't think the American public is interested in the Roosevelts anymore. Edward Herman, who played FDR, and I had two years to do research. Fortunately, both of us lived not far from Hyde Park. So we would go up there, and I immersed myself in letters and photographs. I saw one photograph of Eleanor when she was about 14 or 15 years old, and There was something in her eyes, and I knew exactly what was going on with that girl. It was really an eerie and remarkable experience that I said, oh, oh, I get what you're feeling. I wasn't even seeking it. I just came. So once I had the young girl, and I started playing her when she was 17 years old, and I went up to 63 with the help of a lot of questionable-looking prosthetics. (laughs) But... I did have a visceral experience of who the young Eleanor was anyway. And the research that I had done aided in the experience. I talked to a lot of members of the family, people who knew her. Joe Lash, of course, had known her very, very well. And it was a remarkable, remarkable time to be able to inhabit that incredible mind and spirit. She was quite a woman. Yeah. Fiennie How do you think it's contributed to the cultural vitality of the nation over the last 50 years? The NEA has been remarkable. Just in my lifetime, right now I'm about to turn 76, I have to tell you that the whole map has changed. When I was a girl, there were community theaters everywhere. There were some summer stock playhouses, many, many places. But there was very few what we call regional theaters today, they're professional theaters. There was one in Dallas in 1960 or so here in Washington, Zelda Fitchhandler and Tom Fitchhandler began Arena Stage, Cleveland Playhouse. There were some, but now they are all over the United States. That's just theater. There were symphonies of great repute, Philadelphia, Cleveland, and so on, but now There are ensembles or symphonies that are shared sometimes or not, but they're all over the United States. um, Galleries, artists, visual artists started coming out of the woodwork. Folk, crafts started to appear, all because of the NEA. There was a possibility for um, artists everywhere to be shown, to be seen, to be heard, to be read. That was very, very exciting, and it's happened. Roger Stevens, who was a very good friend of mine and the first chairman of the NEA and who worked um, for the Kennedys and conceived really of the idea of the National Endowment for the Arts, wanted to have the arts decentralized so that they weren't just in the big centers of New York, Los Angeles, um, or Washington, D.C., Chicago, that they were all over so that everybody could experience the greatness of of what can be brought to and what people can participate in. And that has happened. And just to build on that a bit, the importance of having a federal agency Mm -hmm. whose sole purpose is to support the arts. Yeah. Well, I feel that the arts are one of the greatest gifts that the creator has given us as human beings. And when you're given a gift like this, you have to utilize it, you have to use it. So of course it should be part of our government because government is about aiding people everywhere 
and giving them the opportunity for happiness, for fulfillment, for a good life, good health, etc. And the arts are part of that. What are you proudest of when you think about your time as chair? I'm very proud that we kept the agency alive, kept it going. It could very easily have gone under, but I think my fortunate trips to all the states, to 200 plus cities and towns, reservations, you name it, made the American people more aware of how they needed to contact their congressmen and make sure the endowment was still alive. And they did it. They did it in spades. I mean, it's the American people who really kept the agency alive because they, they said, what are you doing? Don't gut the NEA, and this is the one that does this and that in my district. So, And then finally, it, this is our 50th. If we fast forward 25 years to the 75th. Uh-huh. What would be your wishes? What would you like to see? I would like people to find the art in themselves more because I think it'll, it will bring more happiness to them and make them feel a part of the whole. I'm very concerned these days about alienation of people in society because of technology, which I love, but it does tend to actually isolate so that it's easier to text somebody or send an email than it is to pick up the phone or even go over to their house. I would like to see more live arts everywhere in the community. And I think people will start coming out of their homes more. They love to come out for festivals. They love to come out for participatory things like that. I would like to see more of that. I think we need more art. Jane Alexander, thank you. And thank you for everything you have done for the agency and for keeping it alive. <laughs> thank you, Joe. It was great. That was actress and former chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, Jane Alexander. You've been listening to Artworks, produced at the National Endowment for the Arts. To find out how art works in communities across the country, keep checking the Artworks blog or follow us at NEA Arts on Twitter. For the National Endowment for the Arts, I'm Josephine Reed. Thanks for listening.